Good evening. We're ready for chapter 25 in the book of Acts for our Wednesday night Bible study. Now after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. The Bible promises wisdom to those who ask for it. Let's pray for that wisdom as we study God's word. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes to your truth. Open our hearts to your will. And that you'd strengthen our backbone that we might obey. In all things, make us like Jesus. Forgive us our sins and the sinfulness that sometimes drives us. Cleanse us and make us your vessels. We pray for our nation, for righteousness, for holiness. We pray that you would protect us, that you would protect our freedoms, that you would help us to understand that only a Christian nation is right with you. Help us to find Jesus in our daily life, that all our nation might be right with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So on the fifth day, because in Jewish reckoning, you count when you say five days, you mean on the fifth day. After five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and an or orator. Now, the reason for that was we jokingly, jokingly call lawyers mouthpieces. But in the Roman world, you really did hire a mouthpiece. It was a very honored and, and important position to be a professional speaker. We're not just talking to Ed McMahon here. We're talking someone trained in debate, trained in um, also pleasant speech. He would give your position for you so that you didn't have to go up in front of the judge and sound like an idiot. They hired him to speak for them. This tells you how serious they are about getting hold of Paul. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. So these people are going to testify in, in Paul's trial. Now when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation saying, now there is a formula to the speech they did. First, he has to... Um, introduce himself basically by flattering the judge. You'll hear it. Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace. You're such a great governor. And prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always and in all places most noble Felix. With all thankfulness, we are so glad that you're in charge of us. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy, I, I pray that you listen because you're just so gracious, a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague. That's literally the word in the Greek. It's translated pestilence or a pest in a lot of translations, but it literally means a plague. And it was at that time a terrible insult, as you can well imagine. Paul's a plague, like the bubonic plague. A creator of dissension among all Jews throughout the world. This was a, um, this the word dissension here also has the idea of sedition. Remember, the Romans 
don't like people trying to rise up against them. And a ringleader, uh, and the word ringleader in our language today means usually a criminal or, or just a guy who leads the group. Ringleader back then was a literal was literally a military term. It was the officer who stood to the right of the front line of soldiers. And a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. They didn't know what to call Christianity. So Jesus they called the Nazarene. So he's the general of the Nazarenes. You hear the military term in there, which is important because there's still he's still accusing Paul of sedition. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him. We, we righteously seized him because he profaned our temple. Now remember, the Romans allowed them to keep their own temple and to keep it the way they wanted to keep it. So if someone profaned it, they had a legal right to kill him, according to the Romans. And we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law, but the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands. He was so mean to our people. While well, we were trying to honorably and justly arrest Paul. Now, he's laying it on thick. Commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we, of which we accuse him. As soon as you talk to him, you're going to find out that everything we said about him is right. And the Jews also assented maintaining that all these things were so. So every witness basically agreed with Turtles. They should, they hired him. So his argument is Paul is just an evil man, a, a plague. He is a troublemaker who wants to get up an army and rise up against the Romans. He desecrated the temple which according to Roman law the Jews could, could execute for and he's the military head of the Christians so Paul stands up now it looks bad for Paul but remember last chapter God told him you're going to Rome it's like if you fell out of an airplane at 8,000 feet. You don't know how you're going to survive, but since God told you you're going to be in Rome next, next year or in two years, you're not worried about death. You're kind of curious, how's God going to get me out of this problem? Then Paul, after the governor had nodded for him to speak, you don't talk until he says so, answered. Again, here comes his introduction. Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. He flattered him, but not so much. He's not worried. I'm glad because I know you're going to judge here for a while, so I know you'll do a good job. Verse 11, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to, to Jerusalem to worship. He went to Jerusalem, immediately went through the process of purification, went to the temple. All you know what broke out. He was grabbed. And he was rushed to, um, to the praetorium where Felix is. The praetorium, the, the, the special guard, bodyguards of, the, um, of here, the governor. And then five days later, the, the uh, Sadducee, the high priest, and the, and the chief priest come with him. So 12 days. You get the point. 
they're saying that I caused great evil, even though all over, even though I hadn't been here for years. I've only been here 12 days, and in those 12 days, they're saying that I raised up an army to start a rebellion against Rome. It's, of course, ridiculous, and that really, he could have just dropped the microphone right there. He, that was it. But he's going to speak on. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd. They, they didn't catch me doing anything. They can't say they did. Either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. Not a one of them is an eyewitness. Not a one of them claims to be an eyewitness. But this I confess to you. That according to the way, which they call a sect, the way capitalized. According to Christianity, which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Paul, at this time, believed that Christianity was real Judaism, that every Jew should be a Christian. And that there was nothing contradictory about Judaism and Christianity. Christianity was simple, simply, as Paul believed, pure Judaism, properly understood. That's going to change, but not yet. This is important because it is illegal in Roman law to have a new religion. You didn't have to have worship the Roman gods. You could worship your own national god or gods, but you couldn't start a new religion. Paul says, I'm not a new religion. I'm Judaism, properly understood. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. How can I be a plague when all I want to do is have a good conscience towards God? Now, after many years out doing missionary work, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation. This is my nation. I'm Jew. I'm a Jew. In the midst of which, some Jews from Asia found me purified. I was purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with a tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. It was Asiatic Jews who saw Paul in the temple. Earlier, he'd been walking the streets of Jerusalem with a um, a Gentile Christian, a Gentile he had led to the Lord. But he didn't bring that man to the into the temple. But they believed he had, or they made it up just so they have a reason to argue. Either way, they said he brought that man in, and they were angry. That's the profaning of the temple that Tertullus is talking about. If they, since they're the eyewitnesses by, by Jewish law and Roman law, they're the ones who ought to be here, not the high priest and, and these guys. They, verse 18, ought, excuse me, oh, verse 19, I'm looking into a light here. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they have found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement, which I cried out standing before them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you. The only thing controversial I said was I believe in resurrection of the dead. And it's not controversial to a Roman, it's only controversial between the Jews, excuse me, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because that was a theological argument they had. Sadducees said there, said there was no resurrection, no life after death. 
Pharisees argued in favor of it. What we're seeing is a kangaroo court, but Paul's not the least bit scared. We get scared for no reason. I said that last week. God is on his throne. Paul knows he's okay. The Roman government could have killed him at any moment. The governor, Felix, could kill him at any moment. The angry Jews could have succeeded in assassinating him as they've tried, as we've been, as we've gone through this Bible study, we've noticed several times. Paul's not worried. God's on his throne. Everything's taken care of. We need to be the same way. It's not an excuse to do nothing when you say that God's on his throne and I don't have to worry. But it is an excuse not to fear. We don't have to worry about what's happening because God is up to it. God is up to dealing with this. He's good enough. But when Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, he understood Christianity a little bit more. Um, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I'll make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul. Now this is a move up. Instead of being chained to one Roman guard or two guards who work shifts, Paul now is in the centurion's care. He's in the praetorium, which was the headquarters of the bodyguards. So it's not like he's going to get away. He's surrounded, but he's enjoying a much nicer place to live now. He's staying in the centurion's home or, or apartment in the praetorium. He is, it's pretty luxurious. A centurion would have a, he would have um, an apartment about equal to that of a captain or a major, at the best a colonel. And Paul doesn't have to be chained. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty. He could walk around inside the praetorium and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. So Paul is staying in a nice place and he's totally free, he just can't leave. That's why Paul's not worried. God's got him. Now after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, now Felix is a pretty lousy human being. The historian Josephus writes about him that he was an, an incompetent governor, a liar, a cheat, and a crook. Two years after this, he's going to um, be brought to Rome on trial uh, by the Jews in Jerusalem who made accusations against him. And he only survives because his brother, who was a very well-known and very popular politician in Rome, spoke, spoke up for him. He's going to die a little bit later, Felix is, with his wife uh, when Mount Vesuvius erupts, the volcano at Mount Vesuvius. Drusilla was his second wife. Interestingly, interestingly enough, his first wife was also named Drusilla. But this Drusilla was the granddaughter of um, Herod the Great. And considered the most beautiful woman in the, in the nation. She was a fantastic beauty. 
it said that when Felix saw her, he just had to have her. She was just that beautiful. She had married a fellow who had been forced to convert to Judaism in order for her daddy to consent to her marrying him. That includes circumcision. So she's only been married to him a year or two when she meets Felix. And legend says that Felix had a Jewish friend who, pretend, who went to Drusilla pretending to be a magician. And, that, and he told her if she would leave her husband and go to Felix, then he would work, he would magically guarantee that she would always be happy. Now, the fact that she bought that tells us that she was fantastically beautiful, but she may have also been fantastically stupid. She's a real dumb blonde even though she's not likely to be blonde. So she does it, though. She leaves her husband and left her faith. She was born Jewish. That's why they said she was Jewish, but she was living a pagan lifestyle with her husband, Felix. Just because some magician she had never seen before, who turned out not to be a magician, had promised he would work magic. For her, for her, on her behalf. He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Remember, he's got to pin down whether this is really Judaism or whether Christianity is a new religion because if it's a new religion, Paul's guilty. Now, as Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, and I've always thought that those three Paul picked because he knew to whom he was speaking. Felix needed to hear about righteousness. The evil, crook needed to know that there is such a thing as being right with God. Secondly, self-control. What kind of man dumps his wife just because he sees a prettier girl? Felix needed to learn to, 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 control, his, to control his behavior. And thirdly, the judgment to come. Now that'll preach. Righteousness self-control, and judgment day. Felix, if you don't get right with God, if you don't control your evil impulses, you're going to face God one day. Romans didn't believe in that. They believed that you died and just went to, went to the afterworld, to the afterlife. But Paul's saying, no, you're going to stand before God. And there is a heaven, and there is a hell. When Paul did that, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. Now, some people mistakenly believe that Felix was guilty. No, no, no. Drusilla's there. He doesn't need Drusilla hearing and reawakening the thoughts of righteousness, self-control and judgment day that she was taught as a little girl. He wants Paul to hush while his wife's there. How do we know that? Verse 20, um, 26. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him. He was hoping Paul would pay him to let him go. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. We see Felix is not scared to talk to Paul. He talked to him for two years. He just had to get Drusilla out of the room. How many times do we not accept Jesus as our Savior because we don't want to repent? How many times do we not accept God's will 
because we don't want to repent. How many times do we know what's right, but we don't want to repent? Sin can look good. It can look necessary even. But sin is sin. And we need to repent of sin. We need to be righteous before God. We need to say no to our sinful urges. We need to remember judgment day is coming. What a wonderful sermon Paul preached to a man who needed to hear it. God had placed Felix in a place, in a position to hear Paul preach to him. I imagine Felix is in hell right now. And maybe people make fun of him down there because he had not just anybody, not just any preacher, but he had the Apostle Paul witnessing to him. Billy Graham tells the story of a, a crusade he did where he wasn't preaching the first night. So he said he put on blue jeans and a jacket and he walked out to sit with the congregation. And he saw an older man sitting on a hillside on the grass. Billy Graham went over and sat beside him. And he could tell the man was moved. And so he asked the man, do you understand what the preacher's talking about? Would you like me to help you give your heart to Jesus right now? The man, Billy Graham said, the man said, no thanks. I want to wait for the big gun tomorrow night. He had a personal invitation from Billy Graham. And he turned it down. Because he didn't know to whom he was speaking. God works that way. He sends people into our life to deal with us, and we don't know who they are. We don't know how important they are. God is God, and God is great, and God has love for you. He loved Felix. He loved Drusilla. And they had a chance. But all Felix is thinking about is getting a bribe. Unfortunately, we see that in our country today. There are people who go into even the Lexington County Jail. Uh, a few years back, I was reading a Wall Street Journal um, newspaper article about Lex, about our Lexington County Jail, that it averaged two years for the stay of its, of its um, inmates. You stayed there two years. Basically, you put the guy in jail and say, if you'll confess, we'll let you out. But if you refuse, well, it'll be two years before you can go to trial. That's a hard way to do justice. That's what Felix is doing here to Paul. If you'll just give me some money, I'll let you go. But after two years, so poor Paul stayed in that praetorium. That was a nice hotel almost that he was staying in. And friends could come and go. They could bring him... Aunt Bertha's blueberry pie and whatever they wanted to bring him. But he couldn't leave. But after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix. And Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, remember these are the Jews who are going to get him, get, take him to court and almost ruin his life. And Felix is trying to do those guys a favor. Ha. Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Paul stayed in Rome, in Roman 
guard care. He stayed arrested. We believe Paul wrote many of his letters, maybe most of them, during this two-year period. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Paul wrote 13 of them. And the book of Acts is more than half the story, filled with the story of Paul. So half the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. He didn't know this. He's staying there two years, frustrated that he can't get back out to do mission work that he wants to do. He loves to plant churches and, and love them until they're big and strong and able to take care of themselves. He wants to get back to that. One reason he wrote the letters is because he loved those churches so much, he would write them so that he could still care for them. Paul had no idea what God was up to. I mentioned the last few weeks that Paul is going to, we know through history that Paul is going to lead many of the Praetorian Guard to salvation. So that at the right time, when all of Rome is upside down, the Praetorian Guard is going to take charge because no one else will. And they're going to name an emperor. And when they name an emperor, it's going to be the first Christian emperor, Constantine. Rome, Christianity goes from being an outlawed religion to the main religion of Rome. Because of Constantine, who only became emperor because of, of the Praetorian Guard, and the Praetorian Guard was put into that position because the Apostle Paul led him to, to Jesus Christ. And Paul was able to do that because he was locked up with them for two years, plus the time he spent in Rome. God is up to big things sometimes that we will never know in this lifetime. We will never understand in this lifetime. It's not our job to know. It's our job to trust God. One thing Paul is doing here is trusting God. He's not trying to weasel his way out. He's not trying to hightail it and run away. He's, he's trusting God so completely that he's curious what God's going to do next. Imagine being at the point of, of faith in your life, that is, you lie on your deathbed, instead of grieving your death, you're curious what God's got up, got up his sleeve for you next. That's faith, and that's peace. We can have that peace, but only if we understand how big our God is. We see Paul's confidence. And we have to want the same. Yes, Paul ends up bound. And we're going to get a few more chapters with this same story. It's going to drag out for a while. But just understand what's happening. <clears throat> the guards around Paul are getting saved. And half the Bible, half the New Testament is being written. The greatest Christian theologian maybe of all time, is forced to stay indoors and write because he can't go out and preach like he wants to. Will you trust God that way? No matter what he's done to you, maybe he's put you in bed and you can't get out. Maybe you're trapped inside your house and you can't get out. Maybe you're trapped inside a failing body and you won't out, but you can't. Will you trust God? Follow Him, obey Him, and let Him work what He's going to work through you. Words to chew on. 
for each one of us. As always, in Christ's service and in yours, I am your pastor. Good night.